Tasmanian native hen are part of the rail family. Rails are a big cosmopolitan group that have got representatives right across the planet. These guys are about 47 to 50 centimetres in size and they're flightless. And we call them turbo chooks because they're really, really quick. The defence strategy of a native hen is running. They could run up to 50 kilometres an hour, which is actually quicker than what most equivalent birds can fly. They use their stubby little winglets as outriggers for balance. You see them chuck a wing out when they corner. It's really cool to watch. Just like our friend the Tasmanian Devil and Tasmanian Tiger, Evidence suggests that the Tasmanian native hen was once found right across mainland Australia. We believe that it went to extinction because of the dingo. Dingoes were introduced about three and a half thousand years ago and they just changed the ecology of Australia. Tasmanian native hens are a common resident in grassy and marshland areas in Tasmania. They're conspicuous because they're about 50 centimetres in size and they're also diurnal, so they're found in broad daylight. They're a grazing animal, so they compete with marsupials like the paddy melon and the Bennett's wallaby, and also introduced animals like sheep and rabbits. Unlike a sheep, or even these marsupials, they don't deal with the cellulose, so they prefer the starch of the new growth. That makes them compete, unfortunately, with farmers. And in the past, these guys have been unprotected and they've been culled relentlessly. As a secondary grazer, the Tasmanian native hen is really vulnerable to changes in habitat and food supply. Two factors may affect them. Global warming. As it warms up, weather's unpredictable, rains decrease, fire increases, which is going to impact on their food supply. The other thing is that they're really, being flightless, vulnerable to predators. Things like the introduction of the red fox. Tasmanian native hens are a very communitive, very social species. They've got a whole range of sounds and postures that they use to communicate. Grunts, clicks, tail flicks, sounds like hacksaw soaring through metal. They communicate aggression, territorialism and also round up the young. There's also a different pitch for different threats. If the threat is on the ground, then it's a low grunt. Like that, a shorter, sharper alarm call is used if the predator is overhead. As the threat gets greater, the sound gets louder and also higher frequency, which may allow other members of the group to triangulate exactly where that threat's coming from. Absolutely amazing. I think personally, one of the most extraordinary adaptations of native hen is their social system. Like some other Tasmanian animals, males are in a very, very high proportion of the population. Studies in other areas of the state show that there's 1.5 males for each and every female. Females are in high proportion in a population you usually get in social animals a male controlled harem, the beach master. When females are in a high proportion in the population, things radically change. You get female controlled harems, and that's what native hens do. There's a dominant female and a dominant male. Last year's young, they take on an altruistic role and they help raise this year's young. Therefore, some of the brothers are helping the dominant male raise his young. 
and that means that they're securing 25% of their genetic diversity into the next generation. Some of these guys may never become a dominant male, may never breed, but through this altruistic behaviour, they still secure their genetics. It's absolutely extraordinary. The subordinate males sacrifice themselves in one final altruistic act. They'll often pretend to be incapacitated to try and draw a threat away. A limp wing, a limp, a gammy leg. They draw the predator away from the flock. Often, they get killed. But still, as long as they're protecting the flock, they get their genes through to the next generation. Species like the Tasmanian native hen really do, in my opinion, show you the evolution of dinosaurs to birds, particularly when you think that the flightless turbo chook can fly actually about 10 metres. The stubby little winglets provide enough lift for them to get up and away from a predator. And that's really how I imagine Archaeopteryx, the first bird, flew to escape predation. It's really an extraordinary snapshot of evolution. And if you ask me what my favourite dinosaur is, I'd have to say the turbo chook. It's not quite as exciting as a million year old footprint fossilised in the mud, but close enough. You can see the footprint of a native hen imprinted in the concrete. Three toes, all very reptilian, like the Velociraptor. Scary. Turbo chooks aren't just fantastic runners, but they're great swimmers. They live in marshland areas, so they can swim particularly well. Check them out. Native hens will breed at almost any time of the year. And again, they've got this extraordinary adaptation of having seven or eight of these nurseries dispersed amongst their territory in which they'll lay their eggs. It just seems to draw predators away, minimise the risk of the eggs being stolen. Six to nine eggs will be laid in two to three broods. There's a 22 day incubation period and then they're off. The other interesting thing about mating is it's actually the only way, other than surgically, that native hens can be sexed. Depending on which position the animal takes in copulation determines whether it's male or female. There's so little dimorphism between them that not even experts can tell them apart. Extraordinary. Like quolls and devils, native hens interact with other species around them. There's two or three bird species that they'll respond to. If an alarm call goes up, then the native hens answer them with their own alarm. It's just extraordinary adaptation. It's almost altruism between species.